The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll revisit our story on Eleanor Mast, the spinning lady of Iowa, take a trip on a boat powered by solar power and soy diesel, and follow the journey of a statue created by WPA artist and sculptor John Bloom. Some people are simply amazing. You know the type. They have loads of energy, goodwill, and talent. They're hardworking and resourceful, and what's more, they always seem to be doing things for others. At age 87, Eleanor Mast is all those things. As you'll see, her life has had its share of ups and downs, but they haven't kept her from going all around. This dress was my mother's graduation dress in 1898 in Parkersburg, West Virginia. I wish I'd lived in Lincoln's time, I've always said. I'm a native West Virginian and I grew up more in the old antique style. I wear a Lucy bag because in the early days the women did not carry purses. There is a verse about it, Lucy Lockett lost her pocket. Eleanor Mast feels right at home next to Herbert Hoover's birthplace in West Branch, Iowa. At age 87, she still enjoys spinning her wheels at schools, public libraries, and festivals like the Hoover Fest. I have to be out with people. I'm a widow and retired and supposedly retired, but I do 40 or 50 shows a summer. And what do you like about them? Being out in the air, getting some exercise, and meeting people. See yeah, how nice and soft it is? You want to feel it? Just what they cut off of the sheep. The first predictable question from children is, how old are you? At festivals, people stroll by all day long as Eleanor shares her relaxing hobby. Oh, it's a continuous thing all day long. Unless it is a place where, in an auditorium or a schoolroom where they are corralled and have to stay. I had just finished five libraries this past month. One of them, I had 97 children stacked on the floor around me. Spinning just means turning or twisting. It's very strong and uh, it can be used for many things, from rope to finest laces. Mm -hmm. Are these as fragile as they feel? No, they, they are very durable. They wash easily. It took Eleanor 150 hours to spin and knit this six-foot wide shawl, which traditionally was made in a circular pattern, folded in half and thrown over the shoulders. She makes hats, purses, scarves, and unique items like this bag made from English sheepdog hair. I've done llama and cat and dog and most anything that is an inch or so long. And I have a cat of my own that I've been combing madly recently. He's still losing so much. Yeah, that straightens out the fibers and gets the trash out of it. You just comb it like you comb your hair in the morning to get the snarls out of it. Before cotton, early Americans spun a farm crop, flax, to make fine linen, such as tablecloths and towels. There's poems and stories written about the girl with the flaxen hair, and that's because it looks so much like hair. People have too much money today. They don't realize how it had to be years ago. If they wanted something, they had to make it. And it's a challenge to make something from nothing. I've heard many women say, I'm glad I don't have to do that. But uh, they don't know what a pleasure uh, enjoyment it could be. I've even been accused of sleeping as I sit to spin. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not. But then. 
At her home in Waterloo, near her lamb collection, you'll find a flock of spinning wheels, large and small. Yeah, it runs around here just, just fine. You couldn't do it fast enough, though, to get any yarn, but it's a pretty good replica. Because of its two bobbins, this 150-year-old wheel could accommodate two spinners, and you can imagine why it's called a gossip wheel. Handed down from her great-grandparents, this large spinning wheel is a reminder of her childhood, when she learned to knit and weave. When you first got started in spinning, I mean, what sort of goals did you have? What did you want to do with really, it? Really, I didn't know then what I, that I would make clothing and all, but that became my whole interest. In after you start to spin, you've got to use it some way, and there has been a great interest in weaving. Even men do lovely weaving. Uh, this one is one I made out of trees, walnut from our farm, and this one even has some Alice Chalmers pieces on it, these gears. I, hey, uh, loader. <laughs> so it's kind of handmade. Eleanor's skills go beyond the construction of a loom. She also makes her own clothing dyes from garden spices, flowers, and other plants, creating earth shades like those found in this colorful material. What do you feel when you know that you have done this, this entire process of doing this? Well, I don't know. I, I have something for nothing. <laughs> yeah, I wear them. Now the coat and the cape I've worn for several years. So do you just have Lots and lots of projects in mind. I'll never get them all done. More projects could be completed if Eleanor didn't spend thousands of hours volunteering at a museum, recreation center, and a hospital. This is her 22nd year at the hospital, where she gets her exercise by functioning as the nurse's legs in the emergency room. Had I been younger, I would have been a nurse. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of the busy work for us. We, we all know what to do without her. It would take two people to replace her, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know. I had a heart attack here in 89. I was going to say, I bet you get extremely good care when yes, you're here. Yes, I sure do. <laughs> and the doctors here are so nice, too. Seem to go out of their way to be nice to me. I don't know why I deserve it. I think she has a love for people, and people in turn love her. And uh, she shows it in every way that she uh, can and in everything that she does. Here's my helicopter friend. Come up here. Come on. Thank you, I don't know I needed this. <laughs> For 37 years, adults and children have watched Eleanor spin at the annual National Cattle Congress Exposition in Waterloo. For 17 of those years, she was the superintendent of the Arts and Crafts Building. Hello there, how are you today? Having fun? She says it looks like That's me. Neat, isn't it? In recognition of Eleanor's decades of service, she was honored in a most unusual fashion. Well, some have recognized me readily and others didn't know me at all. They'll turn and look, it was that you? Oh, I think it's great. I didn't know how she was going to do it all, but it worked out beautifully. But I told him, all the other characters you've had have been dead, and I'm still living. <laughs> And what did we just hear that a little boy asked? If I, I was in there, if I was under the butter. <laughs> Some big thinkers thrive on the sheer variety of experiences they can dream up, while others just want to make sure their plans include adventure. Brian Peterson is a man who seems to want both and the steady flow of his ideas has led him to the Pacific. You know what they do is they, they typically they, don't, they have no place to sit unless it's a saddle. Mm -hmm. And they have straps that they put on the deck that they slide mm -hmm. their feet under, mm -hmm. and then they wear a crash helmet. I mean, I, I support him in it, and I want him to do it. I love him, and this is what he wants to do. And also, I'm a little worried about the risk involved and the separation and, and all. It's all the unknown factors. Janice Peterson is talking about her husband, Brian, and her concern for him is well-founded. She is anticipating, two months after this fundraising party, his attempt to take this 24-foot rescue boat around the world. A lot of people have a lot of dreams, but he seems to be able to make his come true. <laughs> Brian Peterson's ability to realize his dreams has led him through a life most of us could scarcely comprehend. 
For 20 years, he engaged in land and sea rescues in Hawaii, California, and Nevada. He organized the first international symposium on emergency medical services. He's owned and operated three ambulance services, an ambulance manufacturing company, and a fixed-wing helicopter ambulance service. Brian has been a policeman, a firefighter, and a hemodialysis technician. He's promoted rock concerts and braved the high seas many times. Currently, Brian, Janice, and two of their three sons call Fairfield, Iowa home. It's there that Brian publishes information brochures for a variety of clients, including USA Today. And now, this. Yeah, he's pretty extraordinary. It's been uh, sort of a roller coaster ride. The name of the boat is Sunrider, which is derived from the environmental nature of the project. The boat is powered by diesel fuel made primarily from soybean oil. Also, all the onboard instruments are powered by an array of solar panels on the canopy. I have a, a water maker that's electric that uh, produces 35 gallons of water per day out of seawater. And again, solar power can be the source for that. So it's a, a tremendously powerful system. While it's easy to get wrapped up in the amazing technology of the Sunrider and the bravado of its skipper, the main purpose of this voyage is education. The trip is scheduled to take two and a half years to complete, to allow time for lectures and public relations events in over a hundred ports of call. In fact, before the expedition even officially started, he was showing off the boat and giving lectures on alternative energy and the importance of environmental awareness. Like this stop at North Polk County High School, where he spoke with students about the trip and the non-polluting renewable resource technology being used. Yeah, let's take it over there and pour some in. Might have a little trouble getting it in there, huh? So here's an important thing to remember, that if you went out to buy, you pull into a gas station, Right now, if this was in one pump and diesel was, was in the other, th this stuff would cost you probably 50 cents more per gallon, so you probably wouldn't buy it. No matter how environmentally friendly and all that stuff, you'd rather go to the movie tonight, you know, than buy this kind of fuel. It's the truth. I mean, that's what we all do. But what you can do is that this can be mixed with, uh, with regular diesel fuel, any combination. That's why there's no hesitation, regardless how much diesel he has in his tank right now, we can pour this right in and it will work just fine. The only thing it should do is it should smell a little bit better depending on the concentrations and stuff that he's got in there. The more of this that's in there, the better it's gonna be. Good show. Um, where's his gas cap? Does he have one? Okay. What we ought to ask him to do is drive around the parking lot and um, slosh it up a little bit. Look what we've just done. You point, poured vegetable oil into the fuel tank of a vehicle and just driven off. And you didn't have to do anything. Oh, I forgot to tell him. There's this, uh, there's this thing, wait till I'm gone, and then you can tell him this. There's this thing that this has been found to be corrosive to rubber fuel lines. So if he has rubber fuel lines, then tomorrow, day after, something like that, you should probably check them. Don't tell him that until he gets back, though, if you don't mind. <laughs> Boy, he smokes a lot, doesn't he? What's he gonna say? Go ahead and turn it off. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. I think it's A-OK. -okay. <laughs> it's A-OK, -okay. all right. What we'll find is something very different than what we find in North America. Because all over Europe right now, if you were to land and uh, take a plane today from here to Florence, Italy, what you would find is that all the vehicles in Florence, Italy, all the municipal vehicles are running on vegetable oil fuel. That there are plants producing this as a commercial fuel all over Europe right now. So it's only in North America where this seems unusual this idea of using soybeans in a diesel engine. Naturally, the soybean industry is excited about all the attention this expedition could bring to soy diesel. Soybean associations from around the Midwest are supplying Brian with all the fuel for his circumnavigation of the globe. The soybean growers in Missouri were the first to jump on Brian's bandwagon. Kenlin Johannes is the president of their association. Well, the Sunrider expedition is a unique opportunity for soybean farmers to get involved in this uh, trip around the world for the environment, so to speak. 
uh, it will give an opportunity to showcase that the fuel is safe and uh, can be used in many applications and, of course, in this case, the marine application. This chair is built for comfort. Let me show you. Swing it this far around and put your feet up on the life raft. This is a way to Hawaii. This is it. <laughs> Throughout the summer, the Sunrider was harbored at Marina del Rey, California, where Brian enlisted the aid of his son, Dan, to conduct shakedown cruises. The plan was for Brian's son, Dan, to go on the voyage as first mate. Dan is 12 years old and would have received schooling from his father and correspondence through the onboard computer. Before the trip began, there was considerable trepidation over how young Dan Peterson might handle the rigors of ocean life. Yeah, let's just go slow for a while, Dan, okay? I'm excited about it, but I'm scared, too, about 40-foot waves and stuff that my dad's been talking about. And I know we'll probably get into some. I want to go, but I want to see what that's like first. During one of the shakedown cruises near San Francisco, overwhelming waves in the dead of night dissuaded Dan from making the attempt. His father is currently in Hawaii looking for an escort freighter to follow to either the Fiji or Marshall Islands. He plans to hopscotch around the world, staying as close to the equator as possible. The trip to Hawaii was the longest planned sea crossing of the journey and required refueling at sea. Again, it was a commercial freighter that made the crossing possible, carrying the Sunrider's extra fuel supplies. We at Living in Iowa will keep you informed of the Sunrider's progress throughout the coming year. The history of art is full of stories of great artists who in their lifetime never get much recognition. The public seems to take its time to acknowledge their talents. Maybe that's why some proponents of the arts have pushed for public art, in an attempt to make a dent in the battle to promote their cause. This is a very exciting day in the Quad Cities for the arts community and for riverfront development. It couldn't have been made possible without the help of many strong supporters in this community from both the public and the private sector. This is a story about the creation of public art. Three years ago, we introduced you to Davenport, Iowa artist John Bloom. He studied with Grant Wood at the Stone City Art Colony in 1932 and later painted murals with the famed regionalist master. When Stone City started, he wanted me to come out there. And I said, uh, I'm tell you the truth, I'm flat broke. And uh, he said, don't give it a thought. He says, we'll find something for you to do. So I went out to Stone City as groundskeeper. And that's where I met Isabel. John met his wife, Isabel, at the Stone City Art Colony. To support his family, John worked as an industrial designer while spending his spare time painting, sketching, and making lithographs. Lithography is a printing process where the image is drawn onto a stone with a wax pencil. A lifetime collection of artwork was accumulating at the Bloom household in the artistic community of East Davenport. Art gallery owner David Lasasso was delighted to discover that an exceptional regionalist artist from the Grant Wood era lived just a block away. Eight years that I've really been involved in getting John's work back out to help John get a name as an art living artist. If it takes a death for recognition as an artist, that's, that's not right. And I'm glad that, that John is getting recognition now. I'm John's friend. I have no contracts with whatever John sells, and it's just fun knowing John and working with him. John says he is dumbfounded at his recent recognition, but pleased that David has arranged commission work for him. To rekindle John's lithographic work, David revived the same press that John used so many years ago. Many of the lithographs are based on sketches depicting familiar river scenes. A lithographic print done over 40 years ago was the basis for this sculpture. Simply, it was an opportunity to uh, direct some attention to the river. 
which I've been very interested in for years and years, walked along it, enjoyed it, and uh, sketched down in Leclerc Park. And I draw pretty fast, so I get down a few lines, just the main gesture to get the idea. These kids are a good example. Each fall, the artists in the village of East Davenport present a fine arts festival known as Riversance. The Riversance committee wanted to give something back to the community in the form of a sculpture while focusing attention on local artists. John Bloom's Watching the Ferry was the obvious choice. Local wildlife artist John Bald led the project. No other artists were even considered. The first thing that came up was, let's see if we can get John Bloom. No other considerations. I think that's why it was so easy. The fundraising probably was the most fun. You know, it's just amazing. If, if the idea is good, things will fall together. The project began over a year ago. John Bloom and David Lasasso donated their time to produce 200 lithographs based on the original drawing, which were sold to raise money for the endeavor. John Bald has also contributed his time, and together with David, used one of our cameras to document the making of this remarkable monument to the river. We couldn't put, first I tried these guys along the rail. I moved them up and it didn't work. Then I moved them both on the bench and that seemed to be the John Bloom sculpts in wood and clay, but for this piece, expertise in bronze casting was required. Sculptor Louis Quaintance was contracted to translate the two-dimensional lithograph into a life-size bronze statue. Louis grew up in the Quad Cities and now teaches sculpture in California. 1992 would involve an exciting but rigorous process of creating a 1,400-pound work of art and placing it along the river's edge. The Riversance Committee sent Lewis a drawing. A few months later, he returned to Iowa with a scale model of surprising detail. Sure. I think it's great. The sculpture is considerably more detailed. From the back, it looks very much the way it was thought of. I didn't think of the sides or the front because I didn't have to. <laughs> and when I was asked what the kids' faces looked like or what they were thinking, I don't think I saw him 45 years ago, so Louis was pretty much on his own. We have John's idea. What I've given to it has been a sculptural expression and hopefully a certain amount of aliveness, a living quality to it, a certain amount of energy to it. I believe the spirit of his work is still there and the expression is probably a little more mine. The Cartridge Pack Company of Davenport donated space, equipment, and labor for the year-long task of making the sculpture. A strong steel frame is necessary to support the 300 or so pounds of clay used for each figure. screen mesh begin to add structure to the lifeless characters. Small wooden cross members are attached to the undersides of arms and legs to help support the heavy clay. checks dimensions by using enlarging calipers, which multiply by three and a half times the measurements from the small maquette to the larger-than-life figures. When it begins to have a life of its own, this is when it begins to get exciting. And we work to enhance that, make it stronger, push it, push it, push it, all the time trying to take it a little bit further. I think most people think that inspiration is a little kind of a hummingbird, like. Uh, angel that's up there and just dives every once in a while. If there is such a thing as inspiration, it occurs when you're working. When Lewis has added as much energy and life to the models as possible, it's time to dismember them. A rubber mold is made for each piece, which is held in place by an outer plaster mold. 
From this, a hollow wax mold is created in the same quarter inch thickness as the final bronze sculpture. A foundry makes a mold from the wax and then melts the wax away, which leaves a cavity to accept the liquid bronze metal. The hollow bronze pieces are welded together and the finishing process begins. Public art is controversial enough the way it is. Not very many of these projects get done very often. We could feed the homeless for what that thing costs, you know. There's another side of the coin there too, you know, sooner or later, the people who want a better cultural climate deserve to have one, especially if they're willing to pay for it. You know, there hasn't been, if very little taxpayer dollars in this thing. It's, it's almost been entirely private. Sooner or later, I feel that the people of the community deserve that. I'd like to see it a lot more. As the sculpture nears completion, John Bald negotiates with the city of Davenport on a proper resting place for the two boys. At the dedication ceremony, he thanks the many individuals and businesses that donated the materials and labor to develop this beautiful site and turn this good idea into reality. Any good idea that involves willing participants from the community to do something that would improve our cultural environment should be embraced and like this river, allowed to flow at its own pace to its own conclusion. I don't think I could add anything to that. The uh, only thing I'd say is that I'm delighted that I had the opportunity to uh, get my work in, uh, accepted and uh, placed in this prominent position, and thanks again. Many people have come together to create this enduring work of art, which represents the past and future fascination with the Mississippi. Now we can all enjoy it. Do I have water on my lenses? <laughs> I encourage people to occasionally have a social contract with the community to realize that there are things that can be done and perhaps they're within their power. And dream, really that's what I'm saying. I'm saying I wish people would dream a little bit and maybe somewhere in their dreams they'll, they'll hit on something that they know that they're capable of doing. They can do something that can have an impact on the community. Uh, Maybe a good idea is nothing more than a dream. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.